We'll come to the time in our service now. We're going to look at a passage from the Bible. We're going to talk about what it means, why this matters, and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible, please turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. If you know where the book of Psalms is, kind of right in the middle of the Bible, keep going right. You'll hit Proverbs, and the next book you'll come to is Ecclesiastes. When you found that, chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, would you stand together with me? If you're using a Brown Pew Bible here, it's page 472. And let's read, or I'll read for us, this passage from God's Word. We're going to start reading 12 through 18, and then we're going to skip down in chapter 2 to verse 12. So try to follow along with me. I'll mention it again when we get there. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Solomon says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. For what is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Skip down with me now to verse 12, the bottom of the page there in chapter 2. I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what's already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks in darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will also overtake me. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man like the fool will not be long remembered. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us once more and just ask the Spirit to come and meet us here and accomplish what He wants to in this time in His Word. Living God, we come now to Your Word asking for You to come by Your Spirit and speak through the preaching of Your Word. We believe that You have inspired these words to be written centuries ago so that this is a living book. This is a book that has power even now and today in our modern busy lives to accomplish the purposes that you want to accomplish in our lives. As we read this morning, when you send out this word, it doesn't return to you void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. Oh God, would you accomplish that purpose in each one of us this morning? As I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. It it hasn't um, always been the case, but from about the time I was in high school onward... I became fascinated with history, the study of history. I loved it. Maybe that's not your thing, but even if you have a passing knowledge of history, you'll probably be familiar with uh, uh, an event that took place, a movement really, that took place around the end of the 17th century and then right through the 18th that had and continues to have a profound impact on Western civilization, really on the whole world, known as the Enlightenment the Enlightenment era, sometimes called the Age of Reason. This is a time period where you had guys like Voltaire, Immanuel Kant, Rene Descartes. You had all these guys emerging on the scene in Europe. And as a result of their philosophy, their thinking, their, their writing, you, you saw what essentially could be described as an en masse just pulling away of the hand from the church, from the monarchy, and re- the society as a whole doing this and then replacing that grip on things like uh, human reason, uh, scientific advancement, individualism, and secular humanism. It's almost as if society as a whole just said, oh, 
finally, at last, I, we can admit I don't need God or, or a king to tell me what my meaning and purpose is. I can discover that for myself through my exploration of wisdom and reason and intellect. And it was a movement that promised unbounded hope and freedom and liberty. And the key to that liberty that had always been restricted up until now was knowledge, wisdom, the unlimited potential of the human mind. I think the majority of us would agree that, aside from some of the obvious hubris and arrogance of of that kind of a belief, the Enlightenment did bring significant changes. It brought scientific advancement to our world that we still benefit from to this day. But maybe you'd say, okay, well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, maybe they had some higher ideals. They thought this was going to change the world. But you know what? That's that's, that's in the past. That's 18th century. We're, We're 21st century people. We're the postmodern era, as it's sometimes called. Okay, so we, we've looked at that, and we've kind of seen some of the cracks in that way of thinking. We know, you know, that knowledge and wisdom, that can't fix everything. We, we get that now. We've made the necessary corrections to that pendulum swing. And that, that's a position that I would want to invite you to reconsider. Maybe. For, I mean, if you just listen to the political rhetoric and com- campaigning of our day alone, from, from the, the Prime Minister of Canada all the way down to the elementary school kid who's campaigning to be you know, on the student council, you're still going to hear champion that very same Enlightenment-era thinking that says knowledge, education, that's the solution. That's the thing that's going to fix everything. It's got all our social ills of the day. We just need more education. If we had more knowledge, we could fix all this stuff. It's one of the reasons that you did pursue or are currently pursuing higher education yourself. We, we, we saw, hey, my, I can be better as a person by becoming more knowledgeable. And I'll serve society better. Society as a whole will be better if I have more knowledge and understanding. In fact, if you truly think that the arrogance and hubris of the Enlightenment era is dead and gone, just listen to a part of this abstract from a book that's just it's still to come out later this month from Harvard psychology professor Steven Pinker. The book is called Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, which states this, quote, Pinker shows that life, health, prosperity, safety, peace, Knowledge and happiness are on the rise, not just in the West, but worldwide. This progress is not the result of some cosmic force. It is a gift of the Enlightenment. The conviction that reason and science can enhance human flourishing, far from being a naive hope, the Enlightenment we now know has worked. End quote. I'll leave it to you to decide the merits of that statement. But even beyond that, even beyond just the reality that we know, the inability and the the limitations of science and reason to answer some of the deeper metaphysical questions of meaning and purpose that we all feel, we all feel the failure, the ultimate failure of the Enlightenment to live up to its promises every day. We feel it each time a politician isn't able to bring about the changes that they promised. We feel it every time a a doctor or hospital isn't able to diagnose that chronic illness or pain. We feel it each time the top scientists of the world can't cure cancer or the common cold. Each time it happens, we're forced to ask ourselves again, why aren't these things enough? Why can't... Science and and reason help us, free us, liberate us like they're supposed to. Why isn't it working? When you ask those questions for long enough, you can begin to question the Enlightenment thesis as a whole itself. You can begin to say, I wonder if that's really what we need, actually, if more education is really the answer. If more of the thing that already isn't helping us now is really the answer to human flourishing, or if maybe, maybe we haven't been missing something all this time. It's a good question. But we're continuing this morning in this series that we began just last week through the book of Ecclesiastes called A Chasing After the Wind. It's a title that comes from the book itself. 
And if you weren't here with us, just very briefly, what what Solomon, who is the author, I'm saying, of Ecclesiastes, what he did last Sunday was to lay out an alternative thesis, an alternative thesis on the questions of life, meaning, and purpose after a lifelong exploration of those questions. And it was an exploration that had the kind of access, wisdom, resources that you and I could never dream of having. And his thesis that we saw in uh, verse 2 of chapter 1 there is simply this. It's all meaningless. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless, which I know sounds bleak and, and dark at first. Before you understand that Hebrew word, hebel, which the New International Version, if you're using this version of the Bible, the translators have translated as meaningless. When you translate that word literally, just at its base form, it means simply mist, vapor, a breath. That's what the word literally means. And as as we saw that last week, we saw already what Solomon's intent in Ecclesiastes is not to say that our lives are without any meaning. The pursuits of our lives are not without any meaning, only to remind us that our lives are brief, they're they're temporary, and that one day they're going to end. Solomon laid out a a general proof of his thesis last week in verses 3 through 11. Now, over the next three weeks, what we're going to do is, in the remainder of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2, we're going to look at three more detailed proofs of that very same thesis as Solomon walks through a comprehensive dedicated study that he gave to three areas, wisdom, pleasure, and work. Those three areas, which I think even in our modern 21st century lives, are areas we often chase after in order to find meaning and purpose in our lives. And the first of Solomon's three tests of his thesis that we're going to cover today is the testing of wisdom to see whether or not the pursuit of wisdom or knowledge from its shallowest to its its deepest boundaries can truly lead us to find the meaning and purpose that we all seek in this life. And if it can finally break us out of that endless, repetitive cycle that we all live out in our days under the sun, which means, essentially, what we're looking at today is an ancient exploration of the very same question that the Enlightenment sought to answer centuries later. The only difference being is that Solomon is just a little bit more forthcoming with the results. Uh, rather than just adopting this kind of, oh, just, just wait, just wait and see, it's coming. Rather than adopting this kind of answer, Solomon is going to be much more blunt and upfront with us, and he's just going to say, nope, nope, it doesn't work. No, no, I, I, I've tested that thesis, and honestly, I've tested it harder than you. I, I've tested it harder than anyone ever possibly even could test a thesis, and here's the result. It's a dead end. I, I've been to the end of that road and that pursuit, and the road just drops off into the fog. It doesn't lead anywhere. I, believe me, the pursuit of wisdom to find meaning and purpose is hebel. It's a mist. It's a chasing after the wind. Why does he say that? Why does he say that about wisdom? What is it that he discovered? I mean, and and if that's truly the case, sorry if you're in university or whatever right now, but I mean, does that mean that just studying is a waste of time? Should we all just get our tuition back, buy a hammock, and just enjoy the ignorance? Because that's just a meaningless anyway. Well, no. Sorry. (laughs) I think uh, to understand Solomon's exploration as well as his conclusions, we're going to have to look a little bit more deeply at what he shows us here. So I want to look at our passage this morning in just three ways. We're going to see the sorrow of wisdom, the injustice of wisdom, and then finally we'll close by looking at the gain of wisdom. Okay? The sorrow, the injustice, and then finally the gain of wisdom. So if you close your Bibles, would you open them up again to that passage in Ecclesiastes? Follow along with me, starting at verse 12 of chapter 1 there. We're going to look at this first area of Solomon's testing, Wisdom. So let's look first of all at the sorrow of wisdom. Sorrow of wisdom. If you look at verse 12 here, Solomon says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, this is basically a reintroduction of what he already said in verse 1 of this chapter last week, where Solomon refers to himself as the teacher. I, the teacher, he calls himself, which, again, as we showed you last week, is where we actually get the title of the book of Ecclesiastes. 
The, the Hebrew word for teacher is koheleth, which means the one who gathers people together and addresses the assembly. The Greek and Latin words for assembly and gathering is ecclesia. So the anglicized version of that is ecclesiastes. So this book means the gathered people. And here, now, as in verse 1, we have the words of the teacher to the gathered people. But it's important now to give closer attention to that designation that Solomon gives himself in verses 1 and verse 12, namely, the king. He says, I was the king. Now, that's significant, not only to show us that the one addressing us is not only a teacher, he's also the king, but also to help us understand that as the king, Solomon has time. He's got access. He's got resources that are unparalleled by pretty much anyone else who might try to test this same thesis himself. He's just got a, he's got a bigger bank account, more expendable resources, a bigger staff, more free spaces on his calendar than you or me or anybody else who could possibly want to come after him. That's what I think he's getting at in the second half of verse 12 in chapter 2. Look over there for a minute. He says, what more can the king's successor do than what's already been done? And when he talks about the king's successor, he doesn't mean the next king after him. He means, what more could anyone who comes after me and tries to test this thesis do than what I've already done? There's nothing more that you could accomplish than what I've already tried. And as we get into this more over the next three weeks, you're going to see just how true that statement really is. And as we said, the first place he seeks to apply all these vast resources to is the test of wisdom. And we see that in verse 13 of chapter 1. Look with me there. First part of 13, he says, I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Now, under heaven there, exact same meaning as under the sun. Under the sun is a phrase you're going to see all through the book of Ecclesiastes, and it just means everything. <laughs> Everything you can see, feel, touch in the natural world that we live in. That's what he means. But it's important to pause for a minute and understand exactly what Solomon means when he says, explore by wisdom everything done under heaven. Explore by wisdom. Because as theologian Philip Ryken points out, the kind of wisdom Solomon has in mind here is not divine wisdom, but human wisdom. That's the kind of wisdom Solomon is talking about here. The very best that human beings have ever thought and said. Okay, so he's seeking to study and learn all that he can by the wisdom that we can know under the sun. That, that's the kind of wisdom he's going to test to its fullest extreme. And we need to make that distinction because as we pointed out again last week, in 1 Kings, which chronicles the life and reign of Solomon, we know that Solomon was given a divine gift of wisdom by God. He was so wise, people came from nations all around to come and see this guy and just hear his wise things that he would say. His, wise, his wisdom was so much that God even said of Solomon's wisdom, quote, None like you has ever been before, and none like you shall arise after you. He's just, he's just the smartest. He just wins when it comes to smartness. Which, I don't know, if you think about it, it, makes you wonder why he even bothers with this first test. I mean, if he's the wisest guy that ever was or will be, why is he bothering to test wisdom at all? Well, the first answer to that question is that Solomon is seeking to explore wisdom as it relates to everyone under the sun. He wants to explore what, what, what is everyone's experience of this. I see everyone chasing after this. Can it really provide the answer that we think it can? So, that's why he's using only the best wisdom that the world has to offer, not his, I don't know, his superpower, if we can call it that. He's not using that. He's just using the available resources that any of us could have under the sun. Secondly, as Riken also points out, God's gift of wisdom to Solomon, quote, did not mean that the king instantly understood everything. Okay, this is not the matrix where he just plugged in, downloaded information. I now know karate. I now know whatever. No, no, he still had to apply himself to the pursuit of knowledge, which is exactly what Solomon did. And the result of his devoted pursuit of wisdom, those many resources at his disposal, the best teachers, philosophers, scientists, everyone that the world has to offer, we see in verse 16 of chapter 1 there. He says this, Look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. So, he's not saying that he knows everything that ever could be known. What he's saying is that both his studied knowledge 
and his experiential knowledge has surpassed everyone. First part of uh, verse 17 is interesting as well because we see how broad his study w- actually went. He says, I-, I, wanted to, I didn't just apply myself to studying the top rung of wisdom. I applied myself to studying the bottom rung too. I wanted to study the wisest and also what does madness and foolishness look like. I wanted to see the whole spectrum of wisdom so we could take a, a comparative approach. I want to see what this really looks like. When you look at verse 14 as well as the second half of verse 17, you see that at the end of Solomon's unparalleled study of all the ways people seek to find meaning and purpose in the pursuit of wisdom, his conclusion is still, it's all meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. As I said, this is where understanding that literal meaning of the Hebrew word hebel, translated here and elsewhere as meaningless, is going to help us. Because Solomon is not preaching some kind of a counterintuitive, anti-intellectual manifesto here, okay? This is not an ancient singing of like a Pink Floyd, we don't need no education. That's not what he's doing here. In fact, Solomon's going to go on in a minute to say, listen, wisdom does have value. It's absolutely superior to foolishness. So it, it does have meaning. So he's not saying pursuit of wisdom has no meaning, only that wisdom as we can know it under the sun is a mist. It's, it's vapor. It, it's something you can't grab a hold of at the end of your pursuit of it. Which is why, as he's reflecting on the conclusions, he says it's, it's meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. And then in verse 18, he, his, his reflection on, on the meaninglessness of it all is he says, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I don't know if that's been your experience or not. I think that conclusion alone in verse 18 helps us understand two things as we try to apply this to our own lives. First of all, if you were like me at all when you were growing up, you just couldn't wait to grow up so that you could learn and know all the secret stuff that adults don't want to tell you about. But then you got there and all of a sudden you found out "Eh." that that greater knowledge actually came with a price. It also came with all kinds of baggage and sorrow because it now meant you also knew all kinds of stuff that you wish you never knew. Kind of a loss of innocence almost that comes about by knowing more. I think that's the first reason Solomon is telling us, hey, don't don't pursue life and build your life and purpose on acquiring more knowledge. Be careful what you wish for, he's saying. Because the more you know, the more you see. And for all the beauty in this life under the sun, there's also much that brings sorrow and grief. Second reason I think Solomon is telling us not to try to build our life and purpose on the pursuit of knowledge is because what you're pursuing, what you're chasing after is a mist. It's a mirage. You, you can't get there and grab it. It's not there at the end. You give your life in pursuit of this, what you think it's promising, but it can't actually follow through on what it promises. Imagine how much sorrow and grief to know I've given my whole life to the pursuit of this, and at the end, there's actually nothing in the box. It's empty. So from Solomon's perspective, we need to say, it's it's not that the pursuit of wisdom and higher education is wrong in and of itself. That's not what he means. But it's why you're pursuing it in the first place that can lead you down the dead-end path. I'll just give you an example from my own life to, to help you understand, I think, what he means by that. If I'm picking up that next new book, if I'm watching that TED Talk, if I am uh, pursuing a degree or whatever, if I'm doing that because uh, I want to steward the gifts and the responsibilities that God's given me as a pastor, and as a father, and as a husband, and all these things, great. It's great. But if I'm pursuing those very same things because I think somehow that uh, having another book on my shelf, having some letters behind my name makes me a better person than you, makes me more worthy of admiration and respect because of those things, all of a sudden, those same achievements vanish from my hands exactly as like I was trying to grab a hold of mist. They don't follow through on what they promise. There's, there's nothing at the end of it when I try to build my meaning and purpose on the pursuit of those things, as good as they are. So that's the sorrow of wisdom. 
Next thing I want to look at now is the injustice of wisdom. The injustice of wisdom. And the road into this is in verse 2 now of chapter 12, that second section we read. This is where Solomon comes back to the idea of considering both ends of the spectrum, the two extremes of wisdom. He wants to know what wisdom looks like over here, what madness and folly looks like over here. He wants to know everything in between. He wants to know what it's like to score 100% and what it's like to score 0% on that exam. He wants to know what it's like to look up into the sky and be able to identify all the different cloud formations with all the fancy scientific names. And he wants to know what it's like to look up in the clouds and see unicorn shapes. He wants to know what it feels like to to remember and actually plan something for your wedding anniversary and what it looks like to completely forget it. He wants to know every, the whole wide spectrum of wisdom. And if you look at verse 13 and the first half of verse 14 in chapter 2 here, you see the result of his comparative analysis is, indeed, wisdom is superior to folly. It is. Okay. Good. And in the same way Solomon says that being able to see where you're going is superior to running through a pitch black night without a flashlight. But as quickly as he comes to that conclusion, he starts to feel a little better about himself. Maybe I didn't waste my time with this study. All of a sudden, a thought dawns on him that just pulls the rug out from underneath his feet. You see it in the second half of verse 14 and to verse 16. Look with me there. He says, But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes both the wise and the foolish. Verse 15, I thought in my heart the fate of the fool will also overtake me. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. The wise man like the fool will not be long remembered. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. Now, we're not told... uh, uh, how or when exactly Solomon came to that conclusion. I like to think, just imagining here in my own mind, that maybe he first came to that realization at a funeral. He's at a funeral one day, maybe for a friend of his, who he and everybody else there knew was just not the sharpest tool in the shed. Everybody just knew, and so they're even like laughing. As the eulogy takes place, and, and the, the guy is recounting a lot of the stories of the crazy stuff that this guy tried, they're all just like, oh man, yeah. he really was crazy. And they're just laughing to themselves, and they're just like, okay, yeah. Anyway, God bless them. See you again one day. And then maybe the body's interred, and they're standing there at the grave, and Solomon turns away and just happens to glance at the tombstone of the grave beside his friend who was just buried. And he sees the name maybe of like his most beloved, wisest professor that he ever had in his training. And all of a sudden, he's just looking at both of these things, and he's just struck with the seeming injustice of what he's looking at. That one of the most brilliant men he's ever known is buried in the same earth right beside the dumbest guy he's ever known. And the wisdom that this guy had, it, it, he's still in the same place. It doesn't seem fair. And I think the reason it feels so unjust to Solomon is the same reason that the leveling of death still feels so unjust to us today. Because whether we recognize it or want to admit it or not, there's something inside all of us that still thinks greater wisdom, greater knowledge should earn me a better and a longer existence. It just should. I should live longer than that guy who smokes two packs of cigarettes a day. I just should. I've studied nutrition, and I know all about the exact amount of calories and how much to eat to be healthy and proper weight. I should live longer than the person who doesn't care at all about that, who's eating every meal at McDonald's. I should live longer than that person. Does it work out that way? It doesn't. And then that kind of thinking leads us into just this weird transformation where we start to view people differently based on how much education they have. We would say, this Nobel Prize winner, this piano prodigy, this this top player on that sports team, their death is is a greater loss somehow to the world than that guy that just got sent back to the farm team, or that faceless kid in an unknown village somewhere, or that heroin addict who went to sleep last night under a bridge and didn't wake up. We we think the death of this person is, is greater than the death of this person. 
Why? Because they had more knowledge. They, they knew more. They were wiser and better people. They deserved a better existence. And even if we do give a mental assent to the belief that, yes, and all human beings have intrinsic value and meaning because we're all created in the image of God, yes, amen. Still, when we're faced with the seeming injustice that arises when the fool and the wise man both share the same fate, the injustice of it just still rises up within us. It still lingers. We see it's just beneath the surface. The whole time feeling that way, ignoring what I think is the very true statement that poet John Donne had said so well. He said, each man's death diminishes me because I am involved in humanity. We make a terrible mistake, I think, when we begin to place people as higher value and worth because they know more. But just as we said last week, and we're going to continue to see throughout this series, the uncomfortable perspective that Ecclesiastes is going to relentlessly point us to is to look at our lives from the perspective of our death. Again, not to, not to steal joy from our lives under the sun, but to inject joy into them. Not to burden us and cover us with fear, but to cut away the cords of fear so that we can, that those are the things that keep us from truly living. It's it's meant to cut those things away when we acknowledge the reality that our lives, they're a mist, they're a mere breath, and then they're gone. It helps us to live better now, recognizing that reality. So, as it relates to trying to achieve higher meaning and purpose in our lives through the pursuit of wisdom, Solomon says, no, that's, that's the exact opposite of wisdom. It's the exact opposite. Because when death comes to you, as it comes to all of us, it's not going to ask to see your CV first. Degrees on your wall, bookshelves full of books, are not going to hold back death's pursuit. So, Enjoy your days. Enjoy the days God has given you under the sun. Pursue knowledge. Earn degrees. Deepen your understanding of the world that God made, says Solomon. But do that in order to enjoy the days God has given you under the sun. Not because you think that makes your life more valuable than someone else's. And not because you think it's going to make your life any longer or extended. For if you believe that, you're going to be overtaken by the very same injustice of wisdom that Solomon experienced. When the walls that you built around you that you thought made you secure from death's reach vanish like the vapor they are when death comes for you anyway. If you look at the second half of verse 15 in chapter 2, look there with me. We begin to see where Solomon lands after this dedicated study of wisdom under the sun as he helps us to understand the gain of wisdom. The gain of wisdom. And this is where we'll close this morning. The question he asks here is, what then do I gain by being wise? That's almost the identical question that he asked in chapter 1, verse 3, when he said, what does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? And if you remember what I said last week, he's not talking about gain in a financial sense. He's saying, what's accomplished? What's achieved? What can I actually take away at the end of this and hold in my hands? And his answer, you see at the end of verse 15, just proves his thesis that he stated all the way back in verse 2. It's nothing. Nothing. Everything ends up being something you can't hold in your hands. It's a mist, a vapor. This, too, is the pursuit of wisdom is also hebel. It's mist, a vapor. But again, in revealing that to us, Solomon is not trying to say wisdom is pointless. He's merely trying to help us to see wisdom from the right perspective. He's he's trying to help us to see it from the perspective of our death so that we can truly enjoy it now in our days under the sun. No longer trying to place a weight on it that it could never sustain. And that right there, that's the true gain of wisdom right there. To enjoy wisdom, to to grow from it, to to learn and explore and investigate with it, but to never try to find our meaning and purpose in the pursuit of it. Why? Because it can't be found there, says Solomon. And the reason it can't be found there 
Solomon tells us plainly in verse 15 of chapter 1. Look over there with me. He says, what is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I think what he's getting at there, what he's trying to remind us of, is that the days that we all live out under the sun are still lived out in a world that remains under the curse of sin. It's a world, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8, that's been subjected to frustration, subjected to futility by the will of God, which means the rules of the game, if we can call it that, have already been set. They're already set in place. And chasing after the wind harder is not going to result in you actually catching hold of it. And I think, despite all the good it brought, that that was the ultimate failure of the Enlightenment. The belief that somehow we could change the rules of the game. That, that, that just by the sheer force of, our, of human intellect, scientific exploration, we could catch the wind. That what was twisted could be straightened. Ignoring the fact that the same one who set those rules in place is the same one Revelation 3 speaks of as he who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I love how Philip Reichen describes the futility of that enlightenment pursuit, which in many ways we're still trying to live out today. Describing our lives under the sun like this. They're like an account that refuses to balance, he says. We can tell something is missing, but we can't figure out what it is. And even when we make an adjustment to get everything to balance, deep down we know we've been fudging the numbers. We know it's not really balanced. As we close this morning, in light of Solomon's conclusions that he's brought to us here, I think it's worth taking a moment right now, here just all together. Take some time in your own seat and ask yourself this question. Where have I lost sight of wisdom as a gift to be enjoyed in this momentary life and begun to see it instead as something that defines me, something that gives me my meaning in life? Where have I started to get those things confused? Or maybe, where do I know I've been looking to intellectual pursuits, acquiring greater knowledge for the security and purpose in my life that can only be found in God? Where have I been trying to build my life on something that is merely a vapor? Or where have I lost sight of the truth that greater knowledge will not, in the end, free me from the same repeating cycle of life that we all must experience in our days under the sun? As we've said, it's only the return of Jesus one day that will ultimately stop that cycle from repeating. Because we don't gain anything from our earthly pursuit of wisdom, at least not anything you can hold in your hands, you can show people, or that can't be taken away from you by death. That's the point Solomon's been making here. But the gift in acknowledging that is that now, now we're free. <laughs> That's a freeing realization. You're freed now to truly enjoy our pursuit of wisdom in the days we've been granted under the sun because we're seeing it from the right perspective now. We're no longer looking or putting an expectation, an obligation on the pursuit of wisdom to give us something that it was never intended to bear in the first place. It's freeing. And then... He just leaves it there. Drops the mic and walks away. And, and, and if you've been to church for any period of time, you want to stop and say, what? what? That, that's it? He doesn't, isn't this the Bible? Aren't we at church right now? Aren't you supposed to say now, okay, but, but God is the place that we look to to find our ultimate meaning and purpose? Yes, he is. He absolutely is. And yes, Solomon's going to say that as well. But not yet. Not yet. He just puts it out there and leaves it there. Because you remember what we said last week. This is one of Solomon's teaching methods. He wants us to sit in the tension of the question for a little bit longer instead of rushing to get to the answer. Put up our hand in Sunday school and say, Jesus, it's Jesus. 
yeah, it, it is Jesus. But he wants us to sit in the weight of the question a bit longer because rather than rushing to the answer, it allows us to really explore our own hearts, to see where wisdom isn't found, where meaning and purpose isn't found, to sit in that a little bit longer and ask yourself, even if I do know where it's found, where am I still trying to find my meaning and purpose in the pursuit of wisdom? He leaves us to sit there and to question it, and so that's where I leave you. We know the answer. We know the ultimate answer. But don't rush to the end. Consider your own life and ask the Spirit to reveal to you, where am I pursuing wisdom to give me what only God himself could give? Let me pray for us.